Welcome to day two, morning one of our exciting mic launch here. Um, I wanted to thank the folks who came out last night for what was a master class from Naomi Klein. I thought she took us through so many different important themes that I'm sure we'll come back to in various guises today. So um, I want to thank the organizers for letting me have uh, the, the chance to talk with her about some of this stuff. And um, I'm hoping that we'll continue to learn from one another as the day unfurls. So we're already running late. I'm going to be relatively brief. I want to say two things. The first one is how significant it is that Mike is structured the way it's structured. Um, it's not a trivial or easy thing necessarily to imagine creating a brand new center across two different universities, public and private, two different cities and states, and to do it with a partner that's been as generous, generous in every way you could imagine as Rutgers has been, um, has been an incredible honor, a pleasure. It makes me excited about the possibility for more kinds of partnerships and collaborations across some of these institutional units. So that's something I think that's central to what constitutes the difference that Mike marks as an academic space, and I want to make sure we continue to flag that. The second thing I'll say really quickly before I let Jonathan come on um, is we're also in a time when the very premise, I think, um, for space, a center like Mike, is in some ways under attack. So, so we know generally about the politicization of everything, um, the demonization of the academy right now. Um, but there's a version, I think, of the argument people make about the firewall that needs to be propped up between scholarship, between intellectual activity, between rigorous engagement with the world under the auspices of precision neutrality, and the idea of being active, applied, and engaged in the world, right? That somehow those two things can't meet. And there's a version, I think, of the kind of intellectuality that Mike represents, the way it tries to fuse an investment in social justice with a key core principle about the reimagining of intellectual possibility that, for me, is not just important for Annenberg or Penn or Rutgers, not even, I would argue, important for the academy and what it might look like in 10, 15, 25 years. But when we try to understand what the long arc of the 21st century might need, I think there's a version of what this center has institutionalized as its own version of the relationship between action and ideas that hopefully will become contagious on its own and help us to recalibrate, to reimagine the kinds of lives of the mind we think spaces like Penn can accommodate and afford. So I just want us to remember that this stuff isn't quote unquote merely academic as if, as if it ever were. And there's a version of what academic knowledge means that is being radically reconfigured in this moment by Mike. And so I appreciate Victor and Todd for coming up concocting this ridiculous idea. <laughs> um, to Michael and Jonathan for being willing to go out there on the limb with them. Um, I want you to know I'm here for you every step of the way, and this matters. I think we know it matters, but sometimes we also have to just declare it to ourselves, um, especially when folks come after you for redefining what they think they mean by intellectual activity. So welcome, everyone. Um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce um, our collaborator in crime, <laughs> uh, Jonathan Potter. Come on up. Thanks. Thank you, John. That's a very uh, generous introduction. Uh, I want to mirror a couple of things. Those of you who were here for the extraordinary event last night will recognize some of that. Uh, the importance, uh, I say, yeah, Jonathan Potter, I'm, I'm Dean of the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers. I should say that to start with. Uh, the importance of being able to reach across between scholarly institutions and join together in a world where increasingly the forces are so difficult to analyze, to undermine, is really, really, uh, it's relatively unusual, but I think it's really something we have to do more of in the future. And 
I was delighted by Marco Della Carpini's enthusiasm about this when we talked three years ago, and it's wonderful having John Jackson here building on that now. Being involved with the Mike Center has been an honor and a privilege, and it reflects an area which is absolutely central to our social challenges that we're facing at the moment. Although media sits within the middle of it, it brings in the world of work, culture, a whole world of economics. Its challenges that it faces are political or economic, technical, they are generational, algorithmic, they are platformic, if that's a word. Uh, they're certainly cultural. And that they are regional and to do with differences between the global north and south, between the different areas of ethnic conflict, regions of migra issues of migration and issues of political conflict on a national and international scale. These, th this topic sits in the middle of this much broader set of things. And indeed, the way in which media is under threat and the way in which media needs to be rethought in that and the importance of that in dealing with some of those issues is at the center of Mike. I love the focus on critique on the one hand and rebuilding, restructuring, reconfiguring on the other. I think those two things are essential. Uh, and although many of the issues that are being identified for critique to do with the technological changes, the financial models, the algorithms, the tech are part of the problem, elements of those things will inevitably be part of the solution as well. We need to understand them. We need to work out different ways of working with them and building on them. And that, I think, is one of the things that Mike is really exciting to do. I think the change over the last decade, 15 years, has been so fast that there's been a period where scholars were kind of ahead and then massively behind. Scholars have been really uh, left behind by a lot of this change and a lot of the pr way the problems are appearing. And we've been playing catch up, we've been working on new alliances, new forms of analysis that we need, new skills that we have to have as scholars. And particularly thinking that we need different partners in communities, in organizations outside of higher education to succeed, to be ahead of that, to structure the change rather than being victims of it. And that, I think, is why this day is so important. Uh, I'm enormously looking forward to it, and I hope everyone else enjoys it. And as I said last night, I, I'm passing you over to Victor Picard from Annenberg School. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I want to thank John and Jonathan again for their support uh, for this, uh, for our center and, and for this event. And I want to welcome you all again uh, for the second day. I think many of you were here uh, last night. It was such the perfect way to launch our center. And thank you again, John, for that conversation with Naomi Klein. That was, uh, I'm still buzzing from that. Uh, it was such, such an exciting way to launch these conversations. So today we have amazing panels all day, and I'm just going to take a few minutes to cover some housekeeping issues and set some context for this morning's panels. I think the only housekeeping issue I have to uh, point out, and you can probably see up here, but we've, this is the information for uh, wireless internet access as well as the uh, hashtag. So feel free to tweet away throughout the day. Uh, the other thing I want to do is thank uh, the organizations that have helped support this event. Again, our two schools, the Annenberg School, the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers, and as well as the Media Democracy Fund and Open Society Foundations. And I also, again, want to thank Briar Smith, our program manager, for doing such amazing work 
uh, to make this all happen, and we've had incredible staff support, so we're very thankful for that. As the Mike Center focuses on uh, problems, profound social problems facing us today, an obvious one, one that I've been working on uh, for the last over decade, uh, and many people in this room have been working on, is the structural crisis, what we used to call the journalism crisis. But even though uh, this crisis has been around for some time, there's been a lag in social responses to the crisis. To paraphrase what we've long said in the media reform movement, whatever your first issue is, whatever your first political issue is, your second issue should be reforming the media system, because you're not going to get very far advocating for your issue without a system that is democratic and accessible to all. And we've known for a long time now that there's no purely commercial model that can support the level of journalism that our democracy requires. And yet, again, there's been a, a lag in understanding about the structural nature of this journalism crisis. Evidence of systemic market failure continues to accumulate. Since 2001, newspapers have, have lost over half of their employees. There are now hundreds of communities across the country that lack access to any local news uh, uh, coverage. These news deserts that are affecting entire regions uh, now are in the uh, hundreds and will soon be in the thousands. And many more newspapers are closing, going bankrupt, going online only. And yet, even in its beleaguered state, most of our original reporting still comes from the newspaper industry. So it's really not about newspapers, it's about the future of journalism. And this is a national crisis, yet there's been almost no policy response to it whatsoever. For some reason, both in the academy and beyond, policy and journalism are treated as two separate spheres. And one of my not so hidden agendas is to try to bring these discussions together. And I think that this morning's panels will help us do that. So um, the other thing that I wanna point out, obviously when we're addressing these problems, it's never simply to repair the status quo, but to reimagine what journalism could be. And one of Naomi's points last night that really stuck with me, I actually woke up in the middle of the night thinking about it, was this idea that so much of our communication system is founded on illegitimate business models and that we have to take collective action to try to create structural alternatives, public alternatives. She uh, argued that there should be more of a commons-based uh, communication system. So we should be finding ways to take our, our communication systems out of the market. So this crisis is an opportunity to create entirely new structures and institutions and there are folks here in this room today who are already doing that. So in organizing these first two panels, the general idea was the first panel would be going into sort of the big picture threats uh, and crises and also policy responses. And then the second panel uh, will help us think through what this new kind of journalism might look like. And I'm sure we'll have everything figured out by lunchtime. Uh, so before I hand things over to my wonderful colleague, Barbie Zelliser, uh, I want to mention that uh, in the last year, uh, Barbie has also launched a, a, a new center, Media at Risk, which looks at political violence around the world against journalists and journalistic institutions. And I think our two centers really complement each other, and I look forward to working on these issues together in the future. So with that, allow me to uh, welcome Barbie to the podium as well as our panelists. I think everyone can just come up right now and we can get started in this morning's discussions. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here, happy to be kicking That's off good. day one after a fantastic evening last night. Um, as a former journalist turned academic, um, I've always focused first 
on practitioners and practice. And this has certainly been at the core of what the Center for Media at Risk is about, which is strategizing uh, about media practitioners at risk of political intimidation. Um, but practice, of course, is not the whole picture, uh, and political intimidation does not occur in a vacuum. Um, much of the precarity that surrounds media practitioners today has to do with a long-standing neglect about structure, uh, a long-standing kind of disregard for the structures in which media practitioners operate. So uh, I feel um, this is a growth moment for me. I'm always saying it's not only structure, it's practice. And now I'm saying it's not only practice, it's structure. So uh, thank you to Victor, thank you to Todd for inviting me here today uh, to be part of this. I'm gonna just uh, offer a very brief intro about our four panelists this morning, um, and then I'm going to ask them to go in the order that they are in the uh, program. Des Friedman, oh, there you go, <laughs> is, professor, <laughs> is professor of media and communication studies at Goldsmiths University of London and co-director of the Goldsmiths uh, Leverholm Media Research Center, a founding member and recent chair of the Media Reform Coalition, which was set up in the aftermath of the UK phone hacking scandal project lead for the inquiry into the future of public service television and author or editor of some 17 or 18 does books reports forget it um, um, uh, he's been called one of the keenest and most insightful thinkers today on the political and economic context of media policymaking, regulation, uh, and reform. And I see people nodding around the room, so we already know that because he was here uh, as a resident scholar a few years back. Michael Kopp, sitting at the far end of the table, is former commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission, whose 10-year progressive leadership as a minority voice under the Bush administration emblematized a powerful, energetic defense of the public interest and ongoing support for localism and diversity. A vocal and strong opponent of media consolidation, his work spearheaded all kinds of things in the media environment, an active media reform movement, uh, public service journalism, increased media diversity, and of course a more open internet. He now works with Common Cause and advises the free press and public knowledge. Caitlin Petrie. <laughs> is Assistant Professor of Journalism and Media Studies at Rutgers School of Communication and Information, previously a Knight Law and Media Postdoctoral Fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale Law School, and a fellow at Columbia Journalism School's Tau Center for Digital Journalism. She works on the impact of metrics and audience analytics on journalism, journalistic practice, editorial judgment in particular, and of course, democratic discourse. And a book to that effect, Desperate Measures, is coming out soon-ish with Princeton <laughs> University Press. And finally, last but not least, Matt Stoller is a fellow at the Open Markets uh, Institute. Uh, Matt has multiple lives, including six years on Capitol Hill as a senior policy advisor and budget analyst to the Senate Budget Committee, where he helped draft reform legislation about the Federal Reserve, power in the banks, and trade. Uh, he's also been an MSNBC producer and a writer and actor for the FX TV series Brand X. I don't know how you bring all those together, but you know, whatever. Probably everybody always says that, right? Uh, he writes for The Atlantic, The New York Times, Washington Post, The New Republic, Vice, and Salon on everything connected to the impact uh, of uh, uh, concentrated financial power. And he's right now working on a book uh, about 20th century monopolies for Simon and Schuster. Schuster. So I want to just uh, end here uh, and turn over the podium to our four speakers. I've given them about 12 minutes each, and then we will open it up to conversation. Come up there. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> Uh, well, good morning, everybody, and you're going to be sick and tired of all the thanks, but I've been waiting a long time to thank you two because it really is exciting to have a center which, well, deals with the issues that keep me, keep me going. So tying together media with questions of inequality and particularly questions of labor in relation to social change. Thank God you've done this. And also, um, the, the other, I know it's a very important for you to bring together, or at least to overcome the historic divisions between academia and activism as well. 
And I can't think of two people who epitomize this more in their work of both seeking to theorize, but also to deliver, to implement, to nurture um, uh, transformation. I, you know, it's just such an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, so I've, I've 10 minutes left to talk about the journalism crisis, and I'm afraid I did want to talk about it slightly parochially from the point of view um, of Britain, because you may have noticed that there is a crisis going on in Britain, and I thought it was interesting that when Jonathan mentioned the word Brexit yesterday, people in the audience laughed. Now, I was at the front, so I couldn't see why they were laughing, if it was nervous laughter, if it was pity, if it was embarrassment, when maybe it was all of these things. But I think this is actually, just to spend two minutes on Brexit is useful because it actually deals with questions of structure. This is a systemic, it, this is not some kind of uh, outpouring, spontaneous outpouring of irrational behavior. I mean, there is some irrational and criminal behavior that goes on, but this is not what we should understand by it. It is a very complicated um, set of developments. Yes, there is a very important legacy of, uh, of racism, of, of anti-immigrant uh, almost hysteria, which we should add has been fostered, has been really set up by years of some of the most powerful tabloid voices. Those tabloid voices that even with a journalism crisis are still incredibly powerful and influential. And a title like the Daily Mail, you may not uh, buy the print version, but there are 103 million uh, uh, users a month. And, th and this is the Mail systematically fostering anti-immigrant um, uh, 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 coverage. There is certainly a kind of imperial nostalgia a desire to return to a time when Britain actually meant something. I think that's there as well. But there really is a third element to this, which is it's an expression of rage and anger against a system, against a neoliberal system that has failed, that has, that has broken many people's communities and societies. So it is a very complex and difficult question um, to, to face, but it means that we are facing in, in Britain um, a crisis. There are many things that are broken. I actually just looked through, in terms of news coverage, of what is broken only this year. These are headlines about things that are broken in the UK. So Parliament, obviously, two-party politics, the benefit system, business rates, the housing ladder, Theresa May's authority, pretty obviously, uh, planning rules, the status quo, uh, political discourse in general, policing, the fashion industry, higher education, the ATM system, and so on. Now, what is interesting is that apart from Theresa May's authority, all of these were broken before Brexit. Britain was divided before Brexit. There are structural causes for some of the problems, and it's very interesting to know that the media are not exempt from this. They have both shaped and will be shaped by this, these tremendous social convulsions uh, that are taking place. And we have a, a, a press system, a system of journalism in the UK that is, is interesting. There are certainly some important new actors, some new players, some new voices that, are, uh, uh, that have emerged out of um, the, the digital environment. But actually, despite the optimism of many people 10, 20 years ago, that uh, the, uh, and this has been fostered by someone like Rupert Murdoch and his famous claim that no one will control the media anymore, haven't you heard of the internet, that actually it's the same voices that are still dominating um, uh, journalism today. And what I wanted to do is just to try and uh, sketch out what I think are some of the elements of, um, of a crisis in which the British press is the least trusted in the whole of Europe. Now, when I said that, that you, you, sh you shouldn't be indifferent to that, because actually that means that British people trust their press less than in, I don't know, let me just pick some places, Macedonia, Serbia, places where there have been huge political and social convulsions against some of the criminal activities between state elites and, and the media. And yet Britain is number one. We have the least trusted system of, um, of, of press. And I just, I wanted to say there are, I think for me, four, uh, uh, me I'll, I've called them media policy failures that are relevant to this discussion. And I certainly think they're relevant to a discussion um, of, uh, of the, the news media here in the, in the US. So, um, how long do I have left? Am I like halfway through? Uh, no, you... Oh, good, good, okay. Um, 
So four media policy failures, and you know, this is just, it's worth sketching them out because I think it's important to say that this isn't just, again, a freak um, occurrence. This is, you know, this is not a natural disaster. Of course, we now know that lots of natural disasters are by no means natural disasters. They are the result of human failings, deliberate human failings. And I think in the policy sphere, um, I think this is also very relevant. Um, the first failure, I think, that helps to explain how we have got to um, a broken media system, I think, is the failure to tackle concentrated ownership. You know, I want to say not too much about this because uh, we have Michael here who can probably tell us an awful lot um, about his struggles um, to actually uh, uh, keep those systems um, of, of regulation of, of ownership in place. But certainly, we just, uh, from the Media Reform Coalition, we just did uh, uh, published our latest report on UK media ownership. And the, there are a few headlines. One of the biggest headlines is that we still have three companies that control 84% of national newspaper circulation. And what's interesting for me is that that has increased significantly since our last report four years ago. Then it was 70%, now it's 84%. Now some people say, what's the big deal? They're just newspapers, but I've already tried to say that these are not voices that are disappearing. These are, and we have all sorts of empirical evidence to back up the fact that it is the voices of the male and also uh, uh, the Sun, owned by Rupert Murdoch, as well as the Guardian, um, that are uh, the more increasingly have a hegemonic hold over um, public discourse. But you know, we, we are facing real problems. Uh, commercial radio is extraordinarily concentrated. Just two companies dominate nearly half of all the, uh, the stations and listening. And just to give you one little example, just a couple of weeks ago, they, without any kind of public accountability, decided, that, that one of the largest commercial chains, that it would scrap all its regional local breakfast shows and just concentrate on three kind of syndicated national breakfast programs. Now, this is at a time of Brexit when one of the... Uh, uh, the causes has been seen as uh, regional voices not finding an expression. So people in the northwest, people outside metropolitan areas, feel that their voices are not being heard. And that even in some kind of distorted way, you know, the idea of local and regional shows being uh, just turned into a single, a singular voice, you would think would be a ridiculous, you'd think it would be a concern for regulators, but it, it has not been uh, even remarked on. So I think a failure to tackle concentrated ownership. We see the rise of giant monopolistic entities, and yet we are surprised when they behave badly. We are surprised when our politicians feel that they have no alternatives except to listen to these giant concentrations of, of capital and influence, even though we allegedly are supposed to have some kind of residual systems um, of, of, of tackling abuses of plurality. Um, that is not the case. The second failure, I think, is a failure to regulate tech companies. And again, I don't want to say too much about it, seeing as we have experts um, here. Um, so again, we are surprised when we find uh, criminal or uh, unsavory behavior on part of companies who have grown in size and influence without any kind of accountability being demanded of them. And now, of course, we are seeing, you know, it's going to be a whole different situation because who isn't calling for regulation? So I had my breakfast donut yesterday reading a news story I never thought I'd saw, which is um, Ted Cruz. Uh, the headline was, Ted Cruz calls for regulation of big tech. Um, uh, who said this? Um, Google should be broken up because of its overwhelming market power. This was, I mean, it wasn't me. In fact, it is me. I always say this. But no, this was Rupert Murdoch's news corporation in its submission to the Australian authorities, arguing that Google should be broken up because, frankly, it was getting in the way of Rupert Murdoch's business model. So we have a complicated situation now where those of us who've been calling for regulation, and we've discussed this, Victor, we need to choose our words carefully because there will be all sorts of calls for regulation which are about shrinking the public sphere, of saving legacy media, not of doing the kind of public interest regulation that many of us are committed to. Third, I think there has been a failure to safeguard robust and independent journalism. Uh, so many uh, uh, examples of this. I and mean, we have the Investigatory Powers Act in Britain, which is, you know, scandalously under-commented on, which makes it hard, you know, criminalizes basic uh, work, uh, uh, allows the surveillance of journalists day to day. We, of course, have something that hasn't yet been commented at this, at this event, 
which is the arrest of Julian Assange yesterday, which has been condemned by virtually all the major journalist organizations. Um, and it's uh, a British Home Secretary who keeps talking about the freedom of the press, refuses to implement an independent system of self-regulation in the UK, but has no problems with sending up an extradition, um, which I think has serious implications um, for, for press, uh, uh, for, for, the, for investigative reporting. And fourthly, maybe this is just more of a British thing, but I think, again, is crucial to our understanding of public media is uh, a failure, the fourth media policy failure, is a failure to sustain independent public service media that genuinely hold power to account instead of, as I see and others see more and more in, in Britain, um, that, that the BBC is more and more captured by the power that, it's, that it ought, normatively speaking, to, uh, to hold to account, such that even the Director General of the BBC, who is a very cautious guy, let me assure you, in his most recent public statement, admitted there was a problem with the impartiality of, of the, the BBC. The BBC has just been giving platforms um, to people on the far right, because frankly, it's nervous about its future and wants to enter the public conversation, no matter the stakes, no matter the, the consequences. So it, public media are at the heart of a solution, but it means what kind, I mean, we have to really ask and interrogate what kind of public media um, uh, uh, we, we want. The name itself will not be enough. So what we've tried to do, I've left some of these outside, the, the latest pamphlet from the Media Reform Coalition, tries to uh, understand the, the crisis of journalism and to seek to intervene in debates. And I think we've done all right because what we hope some of us at least, will be the next government, a Labour government, has actually taken on board um, many of these, uh, these solutions for a much more interventionist plurality regime, to actually have the regular plurality reviews um, so that we understand the scale of concentration. They promised it, but they never deliver it. We need, and there are details in here, um, which have been received very well, about a, 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 a programme of de democratic reform of the BBC. We need to give much more, we need to address some of the questions of labor that have taken place inside the BBC, that it is an organization overwhelmingly dominated uh, by people from, from um, Oxford and Cambridge, uh, that it does not reflect the population that it seeks to represent, that it is mandated with representing. We need systematic reform um, of the BBC to restore a kind of public legitimacy to it that it is increasingly lacking. We need uh, now, uh, 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 we need to rebuild journalism, not just to from the top down, but from the bottom up. So of course we should tackle the tech companies. I think we have, we've proposed a levy of 2% um, of the largest tech companies to feed that money back into public interest journalism, which will not just, which will be reserved for non-profits and cooperative ventures, not that it will just be used to go into the pockets of the legacy media who are now pleading poverty unjustifiably, but it also means a systematic emphasis on rebuilding from the bottom up, serving communities instead of abandoning them, and of course a form of tech regulation um, that doesn't simply hand the ability to shape regulation to the tech companies themselves, which is what I suspect is starting to happen now. We need a genuine form of public interest uh, 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 regulation, which will reinsert our needs, our divisions, our voices, our arguments into some of the public uh, uh, interest regulation that so desperately needs to take place. So I am so thrilled to be here because I know that these are some of the questions that this centre, I hope in conjunction with other voices, organisations, from the smallest local voices which are crucial, up to some international solidarities that I hope we can forge. I see that as the future of the centre, and I'm just, I'm honoured to be part of it. Thank you very much. Well, good morning to uh, everybody. Thank you uh, so much to the deans for convening this, and Victor, and Todd, and Breyer. Uh, this mic is happy to be at your mic. <laughs> I never thought I'd have a center named after me, but, but it's, uh, it's very comforting. Uh, I'm going to cover and elaborate a little bit on some of the grounds that uh, uh, Professor Friedman covered uh, so uh, eloquently and talk a little bit about some of the uh, structural changes and the behavioral 
consequences that those structural changes had on our journalism. This is the uh, issue of all issues that motivates me right now uh, because it is so integrally linked uh, to the fate of our democracy. Uh, you cannot have people practicing the practical art of self-government unless you have an informed electorate and thanks to the changes in our media environment, structural and, uh, and otherwise, we have sufficiently dumbed down the civic dialogue in this country where one really has to question the ability uh, of the body politic to make intelligent decisions for the future. It goes to the basis of our self-government uh, self and I don't think there's a more important issue that we face. When I went to the FCC back in 2001, I thought, boy, this is the uh, neatest job on God's green earth. I'm going to be dealing with all of the edge of the envelope uh, issues, introdu introducing us to a, a new future, We're fixed traditional media, but more importantly, uh, even then, how do we make this new tool of the uh, uh, internet the town square of our democracy? I'll be seeing all of the movers and shakers and innovators in dealing with all of these uh, edge of the envelope issues. Then the first day I was there, the telephone rang and it was Chairman Michael Powell calling me and he said, would you please vote with us uh, as we try to approve a merger deal between uh, Fox, I think it wasn't Chris Craft, wasn't a merger but boats, it was a, it was a, uh, a merger of, uh, of media companies. And uh, I told him I couldn't go with him, but then the reality of my new job really dawned on me instead of meeting with all of those innovators and entrepreneurs, and of course we did some of that, I was meeting mostly with the steady profession of media moguls who were coming through my office, uh, wanting to get bigger, wanting to uh, merge, telling me about all these wonderful economies of scale and good things and uh, more news were going to happen. Uh, uh, because of their proposed merger, I voted against most of them, uh, but that vote was in the minority. We had a majority for mergers, uh, both under the Republican chairman when I was there and, uh, and uh, President Obama's uh, first chairman of the FCC. I was the only commissioner who voted against the uh, uh, NBCU-Comcast merger, and if that wasn't sufficient to wake people up to what mergers meant, uh, I don't know what would have been because here you were talking about, to my mind, the classic definition of monopoly, which is control of the distribution and the content both. If that isn't what Rockefeller and all these people were doing back a uh, century and a half ago, I don't know what was, but, uh, uh, but that argument uh, didn't have much take against the, uh, the powers that be. So we've had merger after merger after merger. The bazaar is still open. It goes on. Uh, you know, we've almost had a Sinclair merger, uh, which did not get passed. It didn't really have much to do with how commissioners thought about, uh, about that particular merger. Uh, and uh, the proof of that is what they're uh, uh, considering uh, right now with the uh, Next Star Tribune merger, which is an even bigger merger than the Sinclair merger. More stations, more markets, and about the same share of national audience, like 72%. Uh, but we don't read about that because the media doesn't want to talk about that uh, story. They covered a little bit of Sinclair because of the uh, ideological uh, story that they could tell and hiring uh, Trump's people to come run the station and forcing, uh, forcing their stations around the country to read their editorials and all. So we'll see a lot, uh, we'll see a lot more of it. And uh, I spent a lot of time going around the country when I was at the FCC trying to warn people about the dangers of media consolidation. I found an amazing level of support for what I've said when I went to communities who were experiencing the loss of local news, of uh, diversity groups, minority groups whose issues were uh, we're not being covered. There's a lot of support out there across the country on uh, issues of media consolidation and net neutrality. You look at the net neutrality polls that have been taken recently, there have been two or three of them, 
They tell us that 80% of Americans think that FCC Chairman Ajit Pai's repeal of the open internet rules was a mistake. As many Republicans, within a percentage point or two, as Democrats and Independents. Uh, one of the AT&T mergers uh, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a poll that said 66% of Democrats, 65% of Independents, and 64% of Republicans opposed that, uh, uh, that deal. Try to sell that in Washington, where you can't get one, well, we got one Republican on net neutrality and Save the Internet Act the other day in the House, but you cannot, you cannot find, it's so partisan, and yet this is an issue, I believe, that if we can craft a message and get media to cover the message and get journalists to be part of the solution and get the folks in academe doing the cooperative work that we can, can all be doing together, we need to start a national dialogue uh, and it's an uphill battle, uh, no doubt about that. So uh, as I went around the country, I would talk about the problems of uh, traditional media, not just the structural problems of consolidation, but also uh, the doing away with all the regulations and guidelines and expectations that we used to have of licensees as we commanded them to come in every three years and get a new license. It was never a wonderful system that was enforced, but at least there were some guidelines and stations understood they had they had to do something to uh, at least give the impression they were serving the public interest. Uh, uh, that's all gone now. Anyhow, I would give these talks and then people would say, well, this guy cops, he's getting kind of old. He's talking about radio, he's talking about television, he's talking about cable, but now we've got the glorious new world of the, uh, uh, of the internet. Uh, it's powers at the edges. Uh, not at the center. It's open, dynamic, it's immune from the laws of economics and monopolistic business models, and long story short, we are finding out uh, that it isn't. Uh, if I've only got two minutes left, uh, where do we go from here? Is it too late to put the genie back in the bottle? And that's not a difficult case to make, that it is awfully late, just given the power of the uh, if you want to call it finance capitalism or disaster or capitalism or whatever the, all the different capitalisms were, uh, we, all, we all understand that all of American industry is going that way towards uh, consolidation. Uh, it's the thrust of the uh, thrust of the ages, but somehow we have got to get the message across that this is a public good. This is something that goes to the uh, essential uh, nature of the country and we must, as Louis Brandes said, we, you know, we, must, uh, we must make our choice. We may have democracy or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we cannot have both. So I wouldn't say I'm a raging optimist, but I think as a believer in democratic government, we have to be uh, uh, involved. We have to think we can change. We meet the challenge. We've met challenges before, although this is a very serious one. There are some things we can do. Some of them we can do in the next few years. Might need a new FCC and a new uh, government to do it and a cooperative Congress, but we need to pass net neutrality. Uh, hopefully we can do that in the next few years. And then start a discussion on the open internet because net neutrality is the prerequisite of an open internet, but it is not the realization of an open internet. You still get all the problems of consolidation, commercialization, the total lack of a model for online uh, journalism. Uh, so we we have to uh, we have to start that discussion, but it's hard to start that one when we can't get net neutrality even uh, even behind us. We have to get the FCC back working in the public interest. Uh, Ajit Pai, as the chairman of the FCC, has been one of Donald Trump's most effective appointments. Uh, I think by the time he leaves the FCC, he'll be able to just hang a out of business sign across the front door of the Federal Communications uh, Commission. We have to get serious about ownership and diversity. Uh, old golden rule, he who uh, has the gold uh, uh, makes the rules, he who rules the, e the airways uh, dictates the nature of what the American people, uh, what the American people see. Uh, women own 7.6% of full power commercial televisions in the United States. Uh, Latinos, I think 4.6%. Uh, African Americans, 
how can we expect to have their issues covered, those communities covered in anything approaching justice until we do something about the ownership rules. Public media mentioned before, other countries are way ahead of us. You can't generate that debate here. The only debate we have is should we zero it out or give it a paltry $485 million a year. Uh, and uh, I'll come along and say, no, we need to do a lot more. There's countries in Europe that spend billions of dollars on public media, and the response is, oh, yeah, but, you know, that means the government controls the media. But as you know, uh, it's not rocket science to create fire firewalls between government and media, and the countries that spend the most on public media are the ones that rank much higher than the United States of America on the rankings of democracy done by Freedom House or The Economist uh, uh, or whatever. So we need to, uh, those are some of the things we need to do, but we need, journalism has to be part of the solution. And I know it's difficult for journalists to do that given the, uh, uh, excuse me, given the limitations under which they work and uh, the work they have to do. But somehow they need to speak up and I know, well, journalism, journalists shouldn't be talking about uh, issues, but when that issue goes to the very nature of their craft and the future existence of their craft, becomes mighty important, not only to them, but to, uh, to us too. And uh, I'm delighted whenever I go around, I like to go to a comm school or a J school and talk about these issues because there is that divorce that Victor talked about between policy and, uh, uh, and, and journalism. I did a paper when I was up at the Sorrentine Center a few years ago, which I talked to a lot of deans of journalist schools and several of them told me that you know, we'd be surprised if 10% of our students knew that there was such an issue as media consolidation, which blew my mind. I know that doesn't work here when you get folks like, like this working here, but uh, getting us all to work together and getting media to cover this issue and try to get it into the 2020 campaign uh, is the challenge we really need to be working on. It's very immediate, it's an uphill climb, but I think, uh, I think we can do it. Thank you. everyone. I'm going to be the, the lone one who's going to use slides. Oh, is this? Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Let me get this on there. Okay. Hi. Um, so to echo all the thank yous, uh, thank you so much, uh, the two of you and Briar and everyone who kind of helped uh, make this happen and get me here logistically. And um, I'm just so excited to be in this company and um, speaking at the launch of what will be an amazing new initiative. So um, today I'm going to talk about audience analytics, newsroom metrics, um, and the role that they're playing in contemporary journalism. Um, so in the past decade, we've seen this rapid proliferation of digital audience metrics, right? So sometimes we call these metrics, sometimes you might know them as analytics, web analytics, um, but we've seen the proliferation of these numbers um, and these data in newsrooms. So we've started to see data dashboards, like this one pictured here, this Google Analytics, pop up on journalists' screens, on their laptops, tablets, phones, um, and often increasingly on giant wall-mounted displays in their offices, right? Um, these tools are showing, often in real time, um, to journalists how many people are clicking on the stories that they write, how many people are sharing them on social media, how many people are emailing them, um, how many seconds are people spending reading your story before they get bored and click on something else, right? It gets very granular um, and kind of brutal. Um, and sometimes these analytics are even taking the shape now of leaderboards that rank not just the performance um, in traffic of individual stories, but also the performance in terms of traffic of individual journalists. And all these analytics are increasingly prevalent in newsrooms. Um, they're also increasingly influential. So they're being mobilized to determine um, journalist bonuses, uh, make personnel decisions, stuff about hiring and firing. Um, these are becoming very, very influential in news organizations um, and have done so increasingly over the past decade. 
And so several years ago, I got really curious about these metrics, um, partly because it seemed to me like they were a really vivid manifestation of some of the big structural changes that were impacting journalism um, and have been for the past 15, 20 years, um, particularly a manifestation of intensifying commercial pressures um, and also the need for journalists to compete in this platform-dominated attention economy. Um, so I saw studying metrics in newsrooms as a kind of gateway um, that would allow me to look at the level of practice, um, as Barbie said, but also do so in a way that would hopefully kind of shed light on some of these bigger structural changes that were happening in the field. And so I conducted an in-depth study of how newsroom metrics, like this dashboard here, were created, um, interpreted, and used. And um, so I did six months of field work at an organization company called Chartbeat. Um, this is a startup. They specialize in creating real-time web analytics for journalists. So um, the dashboard you just saw of the writers ranked is a data that's powered partly by Chartbeat. Um, and I wanted to see how a newsroom analytics company made these big decisions about, OK, we want to quantify the performance of journalism. How are we going to do that? What kinds of metrics are we going to be looking at? How are we going to count them? What's the methodology? And then crucially, this turned out to be crucial, how are we going to sell this, right? How are we going to sell this to journalists and kind of get their buy-in? What's the marketing play here? Um, so I did, I did field work there. Um, and then I wanted to know what it was like to work in a newsroom that was using a tool like Chartbeat. Um, so I wanted to know how data were circulating amongst journalists, um, how data were being interpreted and put to use, um, and with what effects. So I supplemented my fieldwork at Chartbeat with um, research at two different, very different news organizations that were both using Chartbeat's tool, um, or suite of tools in their newsrooms, um, to see kind of how the same analytics were taken up in different newsrooms. So one of these was the New York Times. Uh, as we all know it, it's a kind of very traditional legacy uh, newspaper. And at first, there was a lot of hesitancy about incorporating analytics into the editorial workflow. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and then I did work also at Gawker Media, which was a, um, a network of blogs ranging on topics from feminism to politics to celebrity to car culture. Um, and their, uh, their management at Gawker was extremely enthusiastic about analytics and kind of put um, this mode of worker evaluation front and center um, in the organizational culture. So because we have limited time, I'm not going to attempt to kind of give a comprehensive overview of my findings, but I'm going to discuss a few key effects of the presence of these analytics in newsrooms um, on journalism and on journalists as workers. Um, and then in the spirit of this panel and, and this center, I'm going to try to close with some thoughts about what could be done to potentially mitigate some of the more pernicious of these effects. So, one effect, probably this will surprise no one, uh, being ranked on a giant dashboard in your office is turns out to be a pretty useful tool for extracting increased productivity from journalists. Um, but what surprised me is the way that this works, right? So um, the way that analytics are very effective at extracting increased productivity is that they're very good. These tools are very good. Tools like Chartbeat are very good at making work feel like a game. And so we're starting to see workplace gamification and type game, gamified user experience um, flood into many different types of workplaces, and newsrooms are no different. Um, and as I was doing this research, I was so struck by how often my journalists, the journalists I was speaking to, would talk about games. Um, they would often compare metrics um, or the, trying to get traffic to a game. And so I realized I was going to need to learn a lot more about the principles of game design. Um, because in designing analytics tools, companies like Chartbeat incorporate several of the very same user experience features that characterize the most strongly habit-forming and addictive games. Um, so one of these is uh, they incorporate kind of immersive and dynamic visual displays. That's a very important part. So this is a screenshot of Chartbeat's uh, dashboard that, that goes up in newsrooms. Um, and this is a, you know, it's a static image because it's a screenshot. But if we were looking at the real dashboard, this would be very much in motion. So we would see this little needle at the top that's measuring the number of uh, visitors currently on the site quivering up and down. We would see this list of top pages in the center shuffling and reshuffling as stories kind of bump each other out of position. Um, and people describe the experience of looking at this as kind of mesmerizing and enchanting. Um, and so that lends people to look at it a lot. <laughs> they like to look at it, and they like to try to kind of get their story to, to bump the other one out of position. Um, like many addictive games, the traffic game, the chase for traffic, also delivers intermittent rewards. This is a kind of important part of game design. So, um, so you know, you'll 
you'll have a kind of unexpected traffic hit, you'll have an unexpected flop, you're never quite sure what the causal relationship was between what you did editorially and what happened with traffic. Um, and also, these uh, dashboards create this feeling of endlessness, right? So there's always kind of one more level to play, there's always one more high score to set. So there was a Gawker writer named Eddie, um, who I spoke to many times in the course of my research, and he said, it's a game. Uh, looking at Chartbeat chasing traffic is a game, a big game, and it's one that you want to win, but it's also one that has no clear end or conclusion. Once you hit your concurrent visitor's cap, your goal that you set for yourself, well, let's raise the cap. Let's hit that. What's our 30-day max? Let's beat it. Let's come up with a new 30-day max. It's endless. And one thing I want to draw attention to about Eddie's remark here is that you see his use of words like you and our and let's, right? Um, and one thing that's crucial here is that metrics don't just make journalists work harder. They make them work harder without them feeling like this work speed up is being imposed on them by management because they form a very powerful emotional relationship to this dashboard. So they actually feel like it's kind of on them. They're the ones driving this intensification of their work process. Um, the second effect that I want to talk about is that metrics, I think, contribute to an homogenization of news content, right? So most newsrooms are looking at the same set of analytics tools, with a few exceptions of newsrooms that can afford to build their own. Most of them are using third-party tools such as Chartbeat, Google Analytics. So they're looking at the same tools. They're looking at the same data points. Um, they're competing for attention on the same platforms. Um, so what this results in is a kind of sameness, which maybe some of you have noticed as you read news sites around the internet um, in terms of aesthetics, topics covered, um, style and tone across different news websites and so on. So the brilliant uh, writer John, uh, John Herman, who now writes for The Times, wrote this piece a couple years ago about the John Oliver video sweepstakes, where every, after every John Oliver episode, HBO posts the longest segment on YouTube. Um, and every news website is in this giant competition, this arms race to kind of post the John Oliver video on their site and draw the traffic that's going to accrue to that video. So I don't want to overstate the case about homogenization here, right, because there's always been pack journalism. Um, journalists have never, you know, really been such uh, fans of going their own route necessarily. They copy each other. We know this. It's not a new phenomenon. But I do believe that the attention economy um, and the metrics that reflect the realities of that economy back to journalists may be intensifying the industry's tendency towards homogenization. And the last effect I want to point out is that um, I think metrics create for journalists the illusion of agency. And this is maybe the most controversial point I'm going to make because we often think of um, workplace metrics or newsroom metrics as making journalists feel as though they're actually stripped of control over their work, right? You feel disempowered when you're ranked like this. But I actually think in some cases, and I observe this, metrics do just the opposite. They actually give journalists a false sense of control because they imply that if you write just the right headline or you find just the perfect share image, right, or you have just the right um, time of day that you're going to post your story to Facebook, um, that you're going to win the sweepstakes, right? You're going to win the game. Um, and I think this can distract from some of the larger structural issues at play. Um, so here we see, uh, this is Eddie again, and he's talking about, so here in this quote, we see, again, the kind of extraction of increased productivity. He's going to try something else. He's going to post something to Facebook. He's going to do something else, always. Um, but we also see this feeling that he has that if he just does this one thing, it's going to have the right results. Um, and the right results would be higher traffic. But the reason why this is an illusion is that metrics actually haven't produced those results at all. Um, so as metrics were kind of first becoming popular in newsrooms about a decade ago, we were told that they were going to help the bottom line, right? So the idea was, yes, you know, maybe there'll be a little bit more clickbait, but it's worth it if it helps you keep the lights on, right? This was the sort of justification. And yet, in the past decade, the presence of metrics in newsrooms has exploded, um, and yet the bottom line is not in great shape, right? So they haven't sort of produced even the effect they were supposed to. Um, they haven't really meaningfully improved the economic straits of news organizations. So even the most digitally savvy news organizations, the ones that were supposed to kind of have this all figured out, right, um, like BuzzFeed, um, even they are struggling. They're cutting 15% of their staff just a few months ago. And so if even BuzzFeed can't win the traffic game, if even BuzzFeed can't, can't win this game, something is wrong here, right? And what's wrong is that the game is rigged. Um, so just like in a casino, uh, you may win kind of your individual round of um, you know, electronic poker or whatever, um, but ultimately the house is going to win, right? You're not in the long game, longitudinally, going to come out on top. And in this case, the house is the platform companies. 
Um, so no matter what kind of corner of the news landscape you look at, Google and Facebook have what I would describe as a stranglehold on the news distribution right now, right? And metrics that are like Chartbeat, um, that go into newsrooms, metrics reflect this reality to journalists, but they don't provide the tools with which to change this reality. Um, they provide the kind of false sense, I think, to journalists that individual news organizations can win at a game that's actually designed by and designed to benefit a different set of companies entirely. Um, and this means that metrics uh, represent and exacerbate problems, but those problems can't be solved by more metrics, right? So it's not as though if we start looking at time spent on an article and not at page views, all of a sudden we're gonna be good and we're gonna have kind of robust journalism again, right? Um, I think the main problem here is that we need to weaken the platform stranglehold over distribution. I think that's kind of the only way to affect change here. Um, okay, almost done. Um, so until about 18 months ago, weakening the stranglehold felt to me to be almost impossible. I saw kind of no way for this to happen. Um, but I actually think we're in a moment of opportunity right now that's really exciting. So we're starting to see potential pathways that this could this could change. Um, so just to go through this quickly, because I'm out of time, um, I've been excited by, I'll talk about a couple of bright spots that I see um, where I could see potentially some of the rules of this traffic game changing. So we're starting to see journalists' collective action, right? And in a couple of different avenues. So the unionization of digital newsrooms has been really um, interesting and exciting to witness. And I think there's an interesting metric story here because actually um, one of the unexpected benefits of this young generation of journalists having lived their whole work lives being constantly tracked on a dashboard is that they are acutely aware of their economic value, both as a collective and individually to the companies for which they work, right? This is not kind of a foreign concept to them because they see their metrics all the time. And so I think, um, you know, one, one interesting potential result um, of the uh, pervasiveness of metrics in these digital news organizations is that journalists kind of have started to recognize their power, their labor power. Um, we also see the kind of Overton window shifting on tech regulation, um, which is exciting. I'm not going to go into it too much. Others can, can speak much more about that. But I think that um, there's a potential here to pressure these companies, because companies will do a lot when they're afraid of being regulated. There's a kind of moment of opportunity where they might change. Um, and then finally, we see um, that tech platform workers are organizing and whistleblowing more and more, and Naomi touched on this a bit last night, um, but we see that you know, they are organizing around issues of military use of AI and gender equity in their workplaces um, and, um, and many other issues, climate change, and if they can sort of turn their attention to um, securing the health of the public sphere, thinking about ways that platform companies can, can do that and contribute meaningfully to that effort, I think they could sort of exert some, some really powerful heat. So. Uh, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Matt. I'm a fellow at the Open Markets Institute. We deal with the problem of monopoly. So I just want to say the most important thing, I'm very honored to be on this panel. Thank you so much for inviting me to this event, and in a sense, um, Michael Kopps helped bring me into the media kind of structure debate um, on when he started organizing around net neutrality, and I just want to give him props for something that is not on his bio, but probably should be, which is that he's like the only FCC commissioner that didn't then go into private equity. <laughs> uh, now, just one tip. For, this is a, a new center that's focused on media and inequality. Um, and I, I think that's a great um, area to focus on. Um, but there is, you, you should just choose whether you're for or against inequality, because there's, there's a lot more money on the other side. <laughs> just, just a tip if you're trying to organize this. Um, <laughs> sorry, I enjoyed that joke. It was much better in my head when I wrote it. <laughs> um, Okay, so I was gonna—I was actually gonna make a joke about optimism, but then, Caitlin, your presentation was like had some optimism in there, which just rudely again ruined ruined that one. Um, how many of you guys listen to podcasts? Okay, um, well there you go. That's actually like a somewhat healthy media ecosystem. Kind of weird, but like it's there, right in front of us. Um, Okay, 
so now to the things that I've written, and this is this I, this will matter later. I I promise you. Um, okay, so I have a book coming out on monopoly in the 20th century in October, um, and I'm at a my my think tank focuses on the problem of monopoly. We got it. We get into fights with Google and Facebook a lot. So we think about technology. We think about concentrated ownership, and we also think about market structure. So when I think about media, I think about advertising markets, business. Who has the ad money? Where does it go? Um, so I would say, and I'm just going to go in my presentation, I'm just going to talk about how Google works. Right? I'm just going to take one company and say, this is how Google is killing the press. Um, and because I think, broadly speaking, the problem isn't that the press is dying, because a lot of newspapers are really shitty. Um, one of the reasons I got involved in the media reform sort of movement is because, and net neutrality, is because it was right after the war in Iraq. And I was one of the idiots who believed the New York Times when they said there were weapons of mass destruction. And one of the reasons I cared about net neutrality, along with millions of others, is because I was really mad that they were trying to close this internet space where people had actually told the truth about things. And um, so I don't really care if any particular newspaper dies, but I do care about the fact that there aren't new ones starting up. Um, and the reason there aren't new ones starting up is because there's no ad money anymore. It's really simple. OK, so I think it's important to recognize that this is not about technology. So uh, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, technology, you know, it's inevitable. It's going to kill the press, right? And that's just the internet, right? Um, but you know, I, back to the podcast question, I mean, that's a healthy market. It's sitting today. Um, and it has, it's, it's just because of a bunch of random things that happen to structure a decentralized market. Well, don't worry, Wall Street's working to kill it. But it works right now, and we can see it function. Um, so why is the press dying? It's because of monopoly power. So I'm going to focus on Google, but the principles are the same on fit for Facebook. They're also similar for Amazon, which is becoming a significant player in advertising. A lot of people think of Google as a search engine or a tech company. But it is actually a financial holding company with a number of different divisions that each have dominant market power in their sphere. The business model is to tie those divisions together and exclude competitors, and thereby control a large share of the online advertising market, which is right now bigger than all other ad markets combined. That just happened this year. Google has two main streams of revenue. It sells ads on its own properties. And it takes fees on the plumbing of the entire advertising ecosystem that pretty much every publisher has to use. OK, so the consumer-facing side, it has dominant positions in search, browsers, maps, online video through YouTube, phone operating systems, and email. Okay, not total monopolies in all of them, but dominant. Um, now, there are a lot of ways the company exploits its power over publishers. I think Caitlin's study, you know, if you get to if you like, look back into the advertising market, there's a reason they use those metrics that homogenize everything. One of them is, is traffic referrals. Uh, but let's just take something that's not in the media world. It's in the kind of, um, it's Yelp. Uh, the, the company downgraded Yelp on its homepage for local search results compared to its own local search results. So this is something about vertical search. Um, and it's really hurting Yelp's business. It's just trying to take over all the local search results, all the local verticals in search. And it does this to a whole bunch of different um, areas, including online comparison shopping sites and so on and so forth. But it does it to publishers. So take the Wall Street Journal. I know we're all fans of Rupert Murdoch here. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about his plight. Um, in 2017, the Wall Street Journal refused to allow Google search users to read its content for free, uh, instead locating its content behind a paywall. If you want to read this stuff, you have to pay us. So Google downgraded the status of the newspaper in its search rankings. Right? You look for an article in the Wall Street Journal, it's not going to show you that in the first or second result anymore. Um, and so subscriptions went up, but traffic to the Wall Street Journal collapsed by 44%. So this is one way that Google uses its power to structure formatting. Um, that advantages its own business and disadvantages different business models, different formatting choices. Poor Rupert. Um, OK, what about the ad plumbing side? OK, because we know about how you can manipulate traffic. It's intuitive. The part that people don't see is the ad plumbing, 
Right. Okay, so Google AdSense and Google Ads have a combined 84% market share of ad networks. Uh, it has an ad mob subsidiary that has 83% of Android app ad market and 78% of iOS app ad market structure. So that, that's when you open an app on your phone, it is very likely, and it has any advertising, it is very likely that that is moving through a Google ad network that you don't necessarily know about. Facebook also has one of these as well. Um, so millions of apps in both Android, not only does it own Android, but all of these apps that go through Android and apps that go through iOS are um, a significant chunk of that technology is run by Google. Okay, it is also this large kind of weird stock market-like system that sits behind all of the publishers. They send their ad space to this system and then ad buyers come and buy ads into that system and, it, and they basically match buyers and sellers. It's very complicated. They throw lots of data in there. It's where most of the privacy violations are really happening. Every single part of that stock market-like system, Google owns an important piece or is dominant. Okay, so how does it exploit this power? How does it exploit its consumer-facing power and tie it to this ad plumbing? Well, Google ties its search data to the rest of its ad platforms. So if you're like, let's say you're a Cadillac and you want to access to information on who is searching for buy a new car. Right? Google knows what you're thinking, knows what everyone's thinking because you tell it. Um, so if you don't know who is searching for buy a new car, that's, that's important information you're leaving on the table. So um, Google doesn't let you buy, I have access to that data unless you use Google's ad software to plan and run your campaigns. Pretty simple. So then they get to see into every ad campaign that's going on if you want access to their search data, which you have to get. Another example is its use of YouTube. So if you want to buy YouTube ad inventory, again, you have to buy, use Google ad campaign software, right? So if you're an, if, and it, it, you know, there was a, um, an example where uh, I think Mondelez, which makes Oreos and Triscuits and a bunch of food that's terrible for you. Um, but they sell a lot of it. They're, they're a big ad spender. And they tried to buy Google uh, YouTube ad inventory using a uh, software called WaveTube, which was an independent, it was called the demand side platform supplier, whatever, some jargon. But they were trying to use software to buy it, and Google didn't let them. And there was this big fight in 2014. And finally, uh, Mondelez said, OK, we'll buy, we'll buy it using Google. We'll change our campaign, and we'll run it on Google ad software. Well, WaveTube then effectively went out of business and sold itself off to Adobe. So you're seeing incredible consolidation in that space, incredible pricing power in that space by Google. So to give you a sense of what this is doing to publishers, so the Australian Competition Authority wrote that of every dollar spent on advertising placed on a third party publisher, between 25 and 50 cents goes to intermediaries. Intermediaries being basically Google, Facebook, a couple of sleazy ad tech players that are still alive. Um, now, we don't have a lot of good information because it's all held by platforms and the, F the Federal Trade Commission. By the way, the FCC is way better than the FTC, but the FTC's job is to nap. So we don't have a lot of good um, information on that. But in this giant stock market that's totally opaque, that's controlled by basically Google, surprisingly, they take most of the cut. Um, now, in terms of the, the charts that you saw um, about how they're kind of turning everyone onto a, um, a, a mouse on a wheel. Um, that, that's a function of the way that they use data. So one of the things that they do is they have, um, when you use their publishing software or their ad buying software, which everybody has to use, or their tracking software, which again, most, most websites use or m apps use, um, then they get all of your user data. Now, typically, you think about this as a privacy issue, but if you think about it from the perspective of a publisher, what's actually going on here is that these publishers are handing over what is essentially what used to be proprietary subscriber and reader information to a third-party intermediary. They're also handing it over to Facebook through the like and share buttons. And what that means is that if you want to access New York Times readers, you used to have to just go to through the New York Times. Now you can just go through a third party intermediary and hit all of those readers when it's cheaper. So what's happened is all of the ad space, which used to be priced based on whether you were a premium brand or not, whether you were a trusted brand or not, is now just a commodity. And Google has the most 
stuff that they can sell and they have the best targeting information so they can reach people cheaper. And that's purely a function of the fact that we don't regulate data rules. We call it privacy. It's not privacy. And it's purely a function of the fact that these guys have coercive power over publishers and can force them to hand over proprietary business information. OK. Now, the point here is that, that Google runs a series of dominant networks, each of which has the power to discriminate and engage in anti-competitive behavior. And it interweaves its, plat its, its uh, subsidiaries in ways that make competition extremely difficult. The result is that Google redirects the flow of ad money from publishers to itself. Again, poor Rupert, but also poor democracy. Um, now, here's where it gets tricky, all right? Because I'm not going to agree with everybody in this room. The solution, at least from our perspective, is pretty simple. You've got to break up Google, you've got to break up Facebook, and you've got to regulate these markets so they're open and competitive. We like open and competitive markets. We like podcasts, open, diverse, competitive markets with no state control, diverse voices. That's a good thing. We like that. The thing is, a lot of politicians, some of them on both parties and all over the world, um, they're split on this topic. We want to regulate the tech platforms. That could mean many different things. China is very much regulating its tech platforms. Um, and there is a strong tradition going back hundreds of years of nationalizing things or fusing state and, and private power in very dangerous ways. You see that in China. But now Theresa May, who I know is, again, really popular, um, proposed that in the UK. We're going to impose a duty of care on these platforms and force them to deal with harmful content. I'm sure you guys trust Theresa May to determine what harmful content is. But let's say that there was someone who wasn't trustworthy who grabbed hold of that power. Um, that might be dangerous. Um, so do not be fooled. OK, there's a long history here. I didn't get into the public policy levers under, underlying all of this, but there are a bunch of them. We have done the right thing before. We know how to run a free press without too much power in anyone's hands. And we just need to get back to doing that. There we go. Thank you uh, to four uh, very good presentations that I think gave us uh, distinct but integrated um, aspects of the structural crises uh, facing journalism today. I want to open this up to questions. We have about 20 questions, and I'd appreciate it if you could uh, identify yourself as you ask. and I have a couple questions, or actually a comment for Caitlin. I think both are comments. So um, metrics seem like evil, right, according to your presentation. And I agree with it. I totally see what you're saying. But you could think about like one of the columns being how the story is contributing to democracy. Or you could see an algorithm that detects when the story, for example, I do research in Colombia, we did some following up what kind of news stories escalated conflict and what kind of news stories um, contributed to peace building. And so you could transform that in a metric too, right? So it's not metric, it's not the, the what's evil. I think it's what drives the metric design. And I'm going to connect with what, um, what uh, Naomi was saying last night, is the business model. Is that the only reason these metrics were designed and not others is profit. But there's other, there, there, you could imagine other types of metrics uh, being designed that are not you know, designed for profit, but designed to measure other variables, not just profit making variables. And my other comment is for Matt. Um, I am very suspicious of this binary, um, free markets good, regulation bad. And always when, when the binary is put that way, the examples come from the communist world. But there's other examples of regulation that are not necessarily one person or one institution. So in Colombia, 
during the 1980s after the McBride report um, uh, kind of pushed for information and communication policies, the Colombian way to regulate television was a what it was called at the time Civic, Civil Society Television Commission. And it was a commission of about 50 people coming from different sectors of, different, of um, civil society. The universities had delegates. The um, uh, agricultural um, campesinos had their delegates. Unions had a delegate. Uh, different political parties had uh, delegates. And this commission regulated uh, commercial television. So, you know, regulation is not this, like, evil, doesn't necessarily mean an evil government person designing and con taking control of media and technology. Those were my two comments. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, in some sense, I agree. I mean, I, I completely agree that it's, I think, um, one of the things I mentioned in the talk is I don't think that's the metrics themselves. I think it's the kind of broader incentive structure that they reflect to the journalists, right? And, and so that incentive structure right now is based around the platform-dominated attention economy, which measures attention in a very particular way that has everything to do with advertising, right? And so, so surely it's true. We could imagine that were that incentive structure to change, um, we might start to see the emergence of other kinds of metrics, right? So I, I agree with you that it's not necessarily that measurement is always evil at all. Um, I will say, though, that, that having looked at, so ProPublica, um, some other news organizations have worked on this issue where they've said, what if we wanted to make metrics for impact, right? Um, what if we wanted to make metrics for kind of journalism that's good for democracy, right? Um, it tends to be a more difficult problem to kind of create a set of simple quantitative proxies for something like that. Um, and it's difficult to, to automate and scale that in the way that, um, that many news organizations feel that they have to do. And so there's some, there's some issues there with doing it. Um, but 100%, I, I agree that, that um, it's, the, it's the type of incentive structure, the, the business model, as you said, um, the attention economy and the way that it works and the way that it's dominated by two companies, basically, um, that's, you know, producing a lot of these problems. But those problems hit journalists in a day-to-day -day basis in their work lives via metrics. Yeah, so I guess I'll start by just saying, free your mind, okay? Markets and regulation, markets are not a right-wing thing or a left-wing thing. Uh, markets are public institutions with structured rules. And there's a tension when in conversations like this where people are like, oh, I hate monopolies. Um, and we need to take things out of these, these market structures. And it's like a monopoly is not a market. That's the point, is a monopoly is private regulation. So Mark Zuckerberg says it sometimes. He's such a great villain, by the way. Um, <laughs> Eric Schmidt was an awesome villain, but then he resigned, and that was sad. Um, but Mark Zuckerberg's a great villain. And he said, you know, one time, he's like, you know, Facebook's more like a government than a company, right? We're really setting policies. And what you're talking about, YouTube just hire, you know, hires policy enforcement specialists. Amazon is a, it has, you know, a whole series of, they basically have notice and comment divisions. That's what monopolies are, right? They're private governments. So I'll, I'll just tell it to you in a very, in a different way. I'll just say, hi, I'm from Comcast and I'm here to help, right? <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. It's an, it's an age thing. <laughs> Ronald Reagan once said the nine most dangerous words in the English language are I'm from the government, I'm here to help. So I was making a joke on that. Problem is Comcast is one word as opposed to the government. So it's eight, but whatever. <laughs> anyway. Um, the, uh, the point here is that when you're talking about markets, you're talking about structures that we design as a democracy, or that we allow private oligarchs or autocrats to design to serve themselves. And because this, the language that I'm using is old language, it's the language of populism, right? It's the language of farmers, it's the language of small merchants and medium-sized merchants who are saying, I have the right to, to trade and intermediate with other citizens the way that I want to without being interfered with by some giant distant oligarch. That's the language that I'm using. Now, that language was stolen from us in the 1950s by the Chicago School, and they then defined markets as monopolies, and they confused us all, and they got into our heads. 
And so we think about markets as private evil institutions, but we also think about monopolies as sort of like bad things, and it's, it's all very confused. And the point is, how we structure markets is a, are a whole series of political decisions, and we can structure markets in incredibly evil ways, and we can structure markets in incredibly useful ways that promote values that we care about. Um, so that's the way I, th I think about this. And the, the markets that we have now, the ad markets that we have now, are structured in ways that service you know, a, a couple of weird guys in Palo Alto, right? That's, that's the way we've done things. We don't have to do them that way. And to, make, to be optimistic, when Rupert Murdoch is complaining, there is a damn political coalition to be built to overturn these autocratic market structures. I mean, that guy sounds like a liberal when he's talking about, you know, Google and Facebook. That's amazing, right? So there we go. Des, did you want to say something? Or he sounds like he's lying. He's not lying. Google and Facebook are stealing his ad money. They really are. Like, you talked about the concentration of ownership in, in England with newspapers. One of the reasons that's happening is because they have to build scale to negotiate with the tech platforms. So concentration in one part of the economy induces more concentration in other parts of the economy so that there can be sufficient bargaining leverage. So to deal with one, you know, one part of concentration, you're going to have to address concentration in other areas. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not buddies with Rupert, but, but there are incentives here at work. Next question. Yes. Um, I have a question, Matt. Um, so I was wondering if you could expand, or I guess spell out, um, why you think the podcast model is a working or healthy one. Just because I'm thinking about all the podcasts I listen to, and a lot of the more popular ones are either like sort of connected to legacy media, so it's like they're sort of funded by New York Times, or they have ads, or like the NPR podcast, but they still like sort of have the same issues that NPR is dealing with, or they're like Hitlet, and that's like they've just been applied by Spotify, so it's like they have these issues too. So I'm wondering if you could just like expand. Yeah, no, that, that's imp it's important, but I haven't studied the podcast market in that much depth, but. Um, you know, and Gimlet, there are a bunch of acquisitions in the podcast market, and so there's an attempt to do to the podcast market what, what happened to the rest of the media. Um, and Gimlet is in Spotify, that acquisition's important. We, we sent a letter to the FTC saying, look into this. Um, and I'm not gonna say, so, so Alexis de Tocqueville, when he wrote, about, um, uh, he wrote about America in 1835, talked about, it's amazing, there are all these newspapers, and there were public subsidies for those newspapers. And he was like, they're all kind of crappy, but there's a lot of them. So it's hard to like, it's hard for anyone to dominate, right? And so I'm not saying there's not, like, NPR sucks. Like, a lot of these, you know, New York Times, it's just like moral vanity daily. Um, but, um, but the thing is, is there's a lot of, of voices, and you're seeing a nascent creation of, like, infrastructure for advertising is being built to allow for diversity of voices. I happen to listen to stand-up comedians because it's, it's less annoying um, on podcasts. But the reason that it works is because Apple, most people use Apple's podcast app, and Apple basically hasn't done anything with it. They haven't put any ad, like data tracking in there because they're kind of like benevolent, de they're like negligent despots. They don't do anything. So they're not tracking anything. And the, because of that, 60% of people use the Apple podcast app. And the content creation and the advertising and the distribution are all separate tiers, and they're not consolidated. And what you see in like Google uh, and Facebook and News Corp and others is you've seen the vertical integration up and down the supply chain. There's not to say that the podcast market is perfect, but it is to say that there's a lot more diversity there than you've seen in most other markets. And they're trying to kill it, but that's what it, that exists now. I run something called Dot Connector Studio. I work at the foundations. We're trying to figure these things out with independent journalists. And I edit something called Immerse.news, which is about emerging forms of media. So a comment and a question. Sorry, Matt, it's for you again. You're, you're getting a workout. Um, Caitlin, I designed those kinds of metrics that you were talking about for ProPublica. They have their own pernicious effects. So, And there's a lot of talk around how foundations are reshaping the Nonprofit journal in space, so it's worth considering <laughs> all sides of the question. Matt, who's the we that's going to break up these global monopolies? Well, I want to throw it to you two because I feel like both, you know, I, I've, I mean, uh, of the people on this panel, Michael Cops is the one who's actually built a coalition and regulatory, as well as some of the free press people in here, to actually do do that. So I'd be kind of curious what what he thinks, and then I, I, England, 
thanks for making us look good. <laughs> um, I'd be curious to hear what kind of coalition building is going on there. Well, that's a great question. Uh, we have to define who the we is, and if the we isn't a vast majority, it's not going to get done. Uh, this is going to have to come from some sort of grassroots growing appreciation, and I think the basis of it is out there, but mobilize that. I mean, nothing good is going to come out of Washington, D.C., we know that, for the next several years. Uh, if anything is going to come out, it'll be from the grassroots, but isn't that where major reform has always come from? He talked about <coughs> populism, progressivism, uh, women's rights, civil rights, disability rights, all of that bubbled uh, up from the grassroots, and it's, uh, it's a very difficult thing to do, uh, to go around and you go into a consolidated media location and start talking about this, and you don't get covered, so you're speaking, <coughs> you're speaking to the converted, and until we can find a way, and that we, at that point, becomes journalists, becomes academe, becomes concerned citizens, uh, uh, everywhere, uh, until we can build that kind of a coalition, it's uh, it's difficult to see. Uh, we talked last night about these big systemic reforms and all of that, and uh, I'm a believer in that, but at some point you gotta start nibbling away where you find an opportunity, and you have to take these huge issues that we have and narrow them down so that they have meaning to individual communities and individual people and begin mobilizing uh, that way. So I wish I had a silver bullet response to your uh, question, but I don't. But then you look around at some other countries, uh, Great Britain and, uh, and others in the European community who uh, uh, seem to have a more aggressive uh, <coughs> approach to, to this sort of thing, and we need to uh, we need to get ourselves a government uh, like that, uh, and we'll hope that's what 2020 means. Um, I wanted to go back to the podcast issue to to answer your question because when you said the podcast market is healthy and diverse, I would just say that it is relatively new and yet to be. Um, dominated in the ways that every other emerging market has shown signs of vitality and diversity and in the end has been squashed. Now we happen to have, I know Chenjirai had his hand up, I'm sure he wants to come back on this, but it's not a coincidence that uh, Spotify spent $200 million buying Gimlet. And this will have, as I hope, unless he's about to disagree with me, I'm sure this has had tremendous impact on what it feels like to work in the podcast industry and the kinds of editorial commissioning decisions that are made. So you may, at this moment in time, be able, understandably, to point to a diversity. But for me, the question is, why would we expect the podcast market to be any different to every other market which has ultimately been concentrated and corrupted? And the reason I say that is because you, when you argue that markets are structured institutions, they are also, I believe, utterly unaccountable institutions. Because how do we, as in publics, seek to structure those institutions? These, they are not open. We don't vote for them. The only vote we have is in the narrowest elements of a, of a kind of consumer mentality, which for me is not an answer to the problem you address. So the we has to be um, those people who seek to insert the, themselves into this debate, the kinds of grassroots coalitions who feel that the ways that the markets have been structured does not represent their interest. In other words, that it stops looking like them. And this is something that is so, you know, um, please don't romanticize the British media market, which is, of course, it is much more mixed. And the BBC has a critical role as a public broadcaster. But when you find that overwhelming majority of people who work with the BBC come from public, from, sorry, this is confusing, private schools, which educate 7% of the British population, when you find that uh, people of color predominantly work at the BBC as cleaners and not as, edit and not as decision makers, this is a, a, a structural problem. Now, when it comes to the markets themselves, it will have to be those people who feel underserved, marginalized, ignored. And I really do think at that stage, I am kind of optimistic, because I think there are also, you know, Brexit has done many things, um, austerity has done many things, but it has presented people's uh, 
whatever, alienation and marginalization in fairly stark, if extremely complicated ways. So, um, you know, I, I want to hear more about, uh, about the podcast market and if, if, if it is likely to be able to shrug off the disciplines that every other sector that I can think of has ultimately been subject to by unaccountable market building. Chenjirai, you've been summoned. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, thank you. I, and I, I just want to say, I mean, it, it's true that I'm, I'm worried about some of the, some of the ways that um, you're describing things, Matt, but I, I think you're trying to get us to think about how we use the word market. And I, I, I want to sort of like capture, because I think I, I think I agree with you on part of that. There were always in some kind of economic arrangement that involves exchange. Um, and, and so it's not a matter, so we need to be careful about how we use that um, or what we're moving toward. But I would say it, it does seem like these questions about whether what's going on with podcasting, whether podcasting is a healthy market, are right at the core of whether we talk about whether markets and the discourse of markets are, are an open market, are, are as what's going to kind of save us. I can say in podcasting, I mean, the things I would look at that I would just draw attention to to think about are the fact that. I mean, as you mentioned, Apple is a huge behemoth that in a way already has tremendous monopoly power in its control of distribution. They are collecting data. They're just not sharing it or sharing it in certain ways. Um, and, 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 you know, behind the scenes, a lot of these other podcast emerging monopolies like Gimlet, other networks, are trying to create arrangements and terms. There's 600,000 podcasts right now roughly uh, on iTunes. Only 1% of them have more than 50,000 um, 50, downloads. Uh, working conditions are hard, are hard. People have to make them, you know, kind of whatever way they can. And so that positions certain actors, a bit, you know, a, a, in a way that's able to make more. And just one other quick thing, not to go too long, is to say the emergence of branded content in podcasts, right? So because, so Gimlet, the fastest aspect, um, aspect of Gimlet in, on places like Pineapple Media are branded podcasts. Just the news brought to you or a story, like literally the future of work brought to you by MasterCard or by J.P. Morgan Chase, or by eBay. And what's happening that's also interesting is that now, because podcasting is so popular, NYC and NPR are following that same branded model. So there's also a structuring influence. So I think all those are worries. I mean, to, I just to think about when we talk about podcasting as a healthy market. So, OK, so just to clarify, I'm not saying that I think you're right that podcasting is going to go to shit if we allow you know, the, the current structure. So I, I have a paper coming out at some point um, on why we allowed Google to ruin the internet, right? Because I remember the blogs and we had advertising. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't um, incredibly lucrative, but like when somebody spent money on ads on my blog, it went to me, right? The problem we're having in the media isn't that, you know, one of the biggest problems is that, that when you put money to advertise on the New York Times, it doesn't go to the New York Times, or, you know, I'm using the New York Times, but it could be any local newspaper or whatever, or any, you know, trade publication. The, what's healthy about the, the podcast market, and it is accidental, right? It's just because Apple doesn't care. It's not because they're good. It's because they don't care. They've effectively set up a healthy market structure accidentally, right? They're not undergirded by public rules. They're undergirded by private rules that could change at any time. And Spotify is trying to buy Gimlet, and they're trying to basically set up their own, like if you want to have access to certain podcasts, you have to use Spotify's app, and then they're going to do what they did to music, right, where they just crushed all of these artists. Um, and you can go back to the BMI ASCAP kind of, a lot of musicians got screwed during that date, but it's not as, it wasn't as bad as it is now. Right, and that's true with like there was a middle class of of artists, and and I think what you what you I'm not saying the podcast market is perfectly structured that we should go back to like the the ways that we set up everything in the middle of the 20th century, but those were much healthier ecosystems, and the podcast is a much healthier ecosystem, so we know what kind of rules work. We just have to make them public, and so to your point and to your point, where's the coalition? There is a, a lot of there are a lot of people in business like Rupert Murdoch, but a whole bunch of companies that are right now being crushed by these three giants: Amazon, Facebook, and Google. You got the Fortune 497 and the Fortune 3, or Fortune because Apple and Microsoft are sort of floating out there. You got a whole revolution in the business community because they understand that they're no longer dining on us; that they're now lunch. 
and so their their politics are undergoing a, a really significant change. A bunch of things are happening. That was what the rationale behind the AT and T Time Warner merger. And then you do have things like the 90 million people that listen to podcasts. You want to know where your grassroots movement is to save podcasting? Maybe you could go to the podcast hosts and be like, "Hey, tell the FTC to stop this merger." That's a lot of people, right? And and people that run podcasts want to tell these stories. They like doing it. There's virtue in that. There's there's something that's good about citizens just doing that. And so why not? You know, there's a great organizing campaign to be run there. You can get a lot of people interested in this stuff really, really quickly because it makes a lot of intuitive sense. And the, 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 the mistake of the left, for as long as I've been paying attention to politics, is that they do not touch people through um, the way that people understand governance, which is through corporations. People associate with corporations a thousand times a day, and the only way the left touches them is as a consumer. But we are not just consumers, this is to your point. We are producers, we are citizens, we are workers. And we need to start thinking about ourselves as producers and workers and citizens and members of communities, and not just as consumers. We have time to sneak in one more question, and you, nope, don't look back. You have had your hand up from the very beginning, please. I did. Um, I actually had a question for Des, which is um, the, you mentioned the Labor Party, the absolutely horrific treatment of Jeremy Corbyn since he's been labor leader by the press, and then what happened around the 2017 general election when the rules change once there's an election called. And I wonder if you could just speak to that a little bit for people in this country who don't follow British media regulation perhaps as much as I do. I guess it goes back to Clementia's argument about avoiding a polarizing discourse around state and, and uh, regulation and markets and, <clears throat> and so on. So the rules that you refer to are broadcast impartiality rules. I presume that's what you mean. So that you have a situation in which the normal situation is that the gloves are off. Um, the press is allowed to say what it, what it wants because this is freedom of the press largely to attack. Um, elected leaders. So uh, in media reform, we did the very first piece of research that showed the absolutely overwhelming um, negative coverage across pretty much every single title from the day and preceding the day that he was elected and something which, which hasn't stopped. This was not surprising, but it was interesting because actually it was a big story that someone who, is, uh, who has a, a, a left lineage would be elected. You might have thought there would be stories about what kind of country is this, that, I mean, what kind of anger is there that has given birth to this, and yet there weren't those stories. They were just the man is a monster or a clown. And it's interesting that the monster and a clown has now been approached by the current prime minister to help save Britain from Brexit, which is an interesting, so that he, had, he now has a third clown, devil, savior. But anyway, it changed in the 2017 election because during an election, um, uh, there is a, a mandated requirement for the parties to have equal coverage. And it was argued that this transformed, or helped to transform, it, it also helped that there was a manifesto of moderate social democratic demands that apparently the British people like, like getting rid of private railways because they rip you off and are late, and having nationalized railways because simply they can't be as bad as the as the prices we pay now. So that was important, but the idea of broadcast impartiality meant at least lip service to equality. And so there was the idea that this fairly, you know, again, it's a kind of anemic but very sensible form of regulation might just deliver the beginnings of a public conversation which wasn't dominated by hysteria um, and so on. Um, and so I think the Labour Party now are, one of the reasons they really want an election is because they fear, they, they anticipate this will be the only time in which they will be able to get their ideas over to the British people without being ridiculed. So in a way the story is that we shouldn't always just associate um, regulation with the idea that it impoverishes free speech. Remember that the, the countries at the top of the free press rankings around the world, mostly the Nordic countries, are those with quite sophisticated levels of public subsidy and regulation, precisely the things that the British 
uh, that people like Rupert Murdoch and his editors have been saying would mark the end of 300 years of press freedom. So it's a fairly contradictory situation, but situations like that um, uh, do help, I think, to expose or make us more sensitive to avoiding the binaries and to actually trying to reimagine ways of public re interest regulation that we desperately need. Thank you to Des Friedman for bringing us back to the title of the conference. Um, I want to thank all four speakers for a terrific start, uh, a really productive way to be thinking. I know that there are still many questions out there. We have 10 minutes to have coffee, so get them as they walk their way up, and we'll see you all back here at 10:15. Uh, thank you.